If we've not yet met, my name is Bill Rector. I am really glad to be with you this morning. Welcome to Country Fellowship Dallas. We're uh, finishing up our study in the book of Galatians, Paul's letter to this little couple of churches in this region of Galatia. And, uh, we'll probably finish this next week, but we're nearing the end of it. If you have your Bibles or whatever devices you've got where you're, the Word of God can be found these days, uh, we're going to be in chapter 6 very shortly. First, let's, uh, let me pray, if you would. Father, thank you so much for the fun we get to have studying you and learning about you together, the fellowship that can be enjoyable. And it can sometimes be just downright necessary as we try to go through life together and all the bumps and bruises. Uh, help us to do that. Being mindful of one another, loving one another, as you loved us first. And we're so glad that you did. And we give you thanks and praise. Teach us now, Father. Speak to us through your word in Christ's name. Amen. Well, Paul's letter to the Galatians has been hitting a couple of crescendos. He's been saying, basically, since you now have the Spirit of God, use it. <laughs> right? As he's speaking to Christians, and we assume that we are today as well, but you know, the, this is a wonderful, beautiful thing that happens to us. We are a spirit being, and we are conscious of our own existence, and yet we are married to a physical flesh that was created good, but is fallen. And if you've lived in this shell of your flesh long enough, you know that it will steer you off the course that God intended. I usually don't have to defend that presupposition with anyone. And I hope I don't with you this morning. But God says, I, I want to save you. I want to create inside of you a new thing. Different from what you were. A brand new being. My existence, born again in you, combined. Your spirit with mine. Amen? If you've not made that choice to accept God's offer, reaching his hand throughout eternity to you, there's just no better time to do that than at 1017 this morning. I have a little clock here. Sammy's made me do that. You'll learn why in a few minutes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And this may be the day your eternity goes from this to this. Okay? And if you've done that, you are a new creation. You are no longer bound by the sinful nature of your flesh, like my dog that can't help but chase the squirrel that's part of her nature. You are free now to make different choices because the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives inside of you and can help you overcome that. Amen? Isn't that just a wonderful thing? Yeah! Yeah! Man, we should just stop here. But Paul says, no, you, it gets better than that. You've got to learn how to use this power living inside of you. And since you have the Spirit, use it. He says in Galatians 5.16, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And then he says in 5.25, he said, Since we live by the Spirit, let's keep in step with the Spirit. Since you have it, use it. And that's, we talked about that a little bit last week. This idea of keeping in step with the Spirit. Much like these beautiful musicians, you know, they all kind of keep the same time and something miraculous happens together when they do that. But no one can keep time for anyone else, right? If Sammy's off, no one can fix that but him. And I, you know, Sammy's off in a lot of ways. <laughs> But you know, the, the, the beautiful thing is when, when everybody is marching in step with the Spirit, there's a harmony that builds of our whole lives. We help each other through this thing called life. And that's what God wants. And yet, no one can listen to that beat and respond to it but you. And that's, I think, where Paul's telling you, I, 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 I can only follow the Lord for myself. I can't do that for you. But together, once we're doing that, if we both stay in step, some really wonderful things happen. Galatians 6 goes like this, uh, verses 1 through 5. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you'll fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. 
Each one should test his own actions that he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to somebody else. For each one should carry his own load. And I want to dig into that today. We just touched on it a little bit last week. Uh, This is maybe, these first five verses of Galatians 6 are maybe the most beautiful thing we can do for one another. And Paul's also warning it may be also the most dangerous thing you can do. When I was in junior high, I took a junior life-saving class because I thought I wanted to be a lifeguard. I grew up in Iowa, which may be the most horribly landlocked state in the Union, but we had a swimming pool that was open from Memorial Day to Labor Day, and man, I, I was there pretty much every hour of that time between Memorial Day and Labor Day, and I thought maybe I wanted to be a lifeguard. I remember, though, being absolutely stunned by this thing they taught us in the very first day of that class about double drowning. Anybody ever heard of that? Some of you have. It's a scary thing. It's the idea that when somebody is going down, they start to panic, and their adrenaline kicks in, they become stronger and more powerful and more violent than they normally would, and sometimes a person going to rescue them is carried down along with it. And they were teaching us a lot about how to avoid that, because it's a beautifully noble thing to dive into the water after somebody else. It's miserable to see that turn into a double tragedy, and I think Paul's warning us that. You are supposed to be ready and able to help go after somebody else, but be careful. There's a danger for that for all of us. Let's dig in. We'll talk about that. He begins by saying brothers, and I think that's really important because I think he means brothers and sisters, but I think the bigger meaning behind that is that he's giving this message to Christians. We need to remember that there's this beautiful, mystical union that we have with God through Jesus Christ doesn't stop us from sinning. I wish it did, but it doesn't. And we all know that. So when he says, he's speaking to believers in Jesus Christ because he knows any one of us could stumble. And he's speaking to believers in Jesus Christ because he's hoping that the ones who haven't stumbled will help those who have. I think that's important to remember. Then he says this caught in a sin. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, and I think that's an interesting metaphor. Uh, it's been interpreted a lot of ways over, over time. In the, the, the old King James uh, said if someone is overtaken in a fault. So that's like you know something came along and snuck up on them. Um, there's another version that used discovered in a sin. So that you, that's what they mean by caught them. And maybe someone was sinning and then you, you finally revealed it for the first time. And I don't know, both of those I guess are accurate. I, I won't get too quarrelsome about that, but... I think what Paul means is this metaphor we've been talking about. If you're walking by the Spirit, imagine all of us on a long hike through a trail somewhere. And we're all going to walk at different paces. And we're all going to be different places throughout that trail. If you come along and see someone who stumbled, I think that's the metaphor he wants us to think. Maybe that we've caught up to them. Maybe that something caught them on the trail. Maybe they tripped over some... But I think that's, that's his meaning here. We're all on one big walk together, one journey. We're all being led by the Spirit individually, and yet there's something that's wonderful about doing it together. And if we come across somebody in our walk that has stumbled, that's what he's talking about. He says that you who are spiritual should restore him gently. This is an interesting word, and if you want to know the definition of the word spiritual, Paul's using it here the way I would want to define it those who are walking in step with the Holy Spirit of God living inside of them. Met somebody the other day, says, I'm a very spiritual person. And I said, great, what spirit? <laughs> and I, I, sometimes I, I'm really bad about responding to people because I, you, you know what I'm saying? What I, it does matter. If, you're, if you are responding to your own spirit without the Spirit of God, there, you, that's, that's not as good. Or it might be a Mother Earth spirit or the spirit of the rock or something. And I don't, I don't mean to mock or deride that, but there's really one right answer to this, and that's the spirit of God is what Paul's talking about. That's a good definition of spiritual. Those who are walking in step with the Holy Spirit, that's what he means. He says, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. You come across someone who's fallen, and that's what you should do. And again, Paul's saying of you who are spiritual should restore him gently has sometimes been taken over in church history that 
Those of you who are godly should restore those who are ungodly. And I, I don't think he wants us to go there at all. I think the better metaphor would be those of you who brought your umbrellas today, help cover somebody who didn't today. Amen? Because it could have been you and it could have been me and you just happened to think to bring your umbrella and somebody didn't and it started raining and maybe even wasn't supposed to. Don't think you're necessarily any better than that. And I think he's really clear about that as he goes into the next verse. He says, you who are spiritual should restore him gently, but watch yourself or you may also be tempted. Don't think this couldn't happen to you. Uh, that's maybe the most dangerous thing. When you come across somebody in a sin, restore them gently and watch yourself that you are not, not tempted. That's a pretty interesting thing, and I think Paul means more than you're not tempted by the same thing. I mean, he could mean that, right? If you come across someone who's tripped and fallen over a rock in the trail, you want to make sure you're careful not to trip on that same rock. But more often the danger isn't that particular rock. It's the idea of thinking that you're somehow better than somebody else because you yourself couldn't have done that. And that's where that's the biggest danger that Paul's going into. I had a friend, and he's doing well now. About 15 years ago, he got into trouble. He was addicted to uh, hydrocodone and some prescription pain medicines for his back. And I, uh, boy, I'm, I don't mean to be convicting. That may be speaking into some lives right now. I'll, I'll tell you, that has never been a particular temptation for me. Even when I go to the dentist and they drill and drill and drill like the deep water horizon, I would rather have an Advil and a Tylenol than that hydrocodone. It upsets my stuff. I am not particularly tempted in that way. Praise God. So the, the danger for me in helping my friend in his stumbling and his addiction got pretty bad. He was pretending to actually uh, be interested in open houses as realtors, you know, and he'd go in and he'd steal the medicine out of people's cabinets, and, and he got caught doing that. And He's doing okay now. This has a happy ending. But about a year into that, in his recovery, he sat down with me and shared this with me. And I'm telling you, I'm going to confess to you now, I thought myself better than him. Because that, that isn't a particular temptation to me, praise God. But it's a terrible thing to think something similar could never happen to you. Listen to the words of Jesus when he says, Hey, all of you tonight are going to fall away from me on the last night of his life. Falling away from the Lord is not a good thing to do. But what was worse than that is what Peter did. Do you remember? Not me, Lord. Maybe these other bozos, but I'm above that. Right? I think he might have said that, Roger. I think he might. These other clowns, they might fall away from you, but not me. Even unto death will I stay with you. And he wrote a check he couldn't cash. His arrogance was revealed, which was a worse sin than falling away. His pride. See, the opposite of love isn't hate. It's pride. It's pride in yourself when you know that you're dependent upon God and all these other people. Ever since we were born as infants, we've been dependent upon other people. <laughs> the idea of a self-made man is such an oxymoron. And yet it, it's idolized to some degree in our culture. And the pride we get from thinking that that could never have happened to me. I confess it to you. That's what I felt. And it was the danger. And the Lord put me through this course. Now, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be careful of that. If you hang around people who have bad habits long enough, they rub off on you. The Bible tells us about that. Uh, a couple of verses, you know. So, I mean, if, if you want to try and witness to people in shady places, you've got to be careful because the, the, the Bible warns about that. But in this case, I don't think that's the big concern. I think the real tempting for a Christian is to come across somebody in a sin and to immediately assume, thank goodness I'm above that. That could never happen to me. Romans 14 was the definitive text as we went through this. This is an idea Paul has developed before and it said, uh, who are you to judge another man's servant? Now, if, if I'm united with the Holy Spirit and I'm in step with the Spirit and my friend who had this problem is united with the Holy Spirit and he's in step with the Spirit, who am I to judge his, his walk? I should help him, but it's not my job to judge him. I hope that makes sense to you 
And I find perhaps I preach on this because I've just had such guilt in this in my own life. There's, Jesus speaks in Luke 18 about this. There's a parable I have written down here, beginning in verse 9. To some who are confident in their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else. I'm just confessing that was me. Has that ever been you? Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And if you don't know much about the history of the first century church, the Pharisees were the people who did everything that they could. They maybe didn't love God, but they looked the part and they did all the right things. And we've learned that that doesn't always help, right? Sitting in church doesn't make you a Christian any more than sitting in a chicken house will make you a chicken, is what Grandpa used to say, right? I, I, I still hear him saying it. And these Pharisees, they did everything right. The tax collectors, on the other hand, were the worst scum of the society. They sold out their own people. The Romans would give them authority to collect the taxes for people, and they could collect as much as they want keep some for themselves and give the rest to the Romans. And if people didn't give, they would sick the Romans on them. They were usually picked as people within the community that sold out, and they were considered to be the worst. So you've got this person that visually does everything right, and this person that's the scum of the earth going up to pray. The Pharisee stood and prayed about himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. Robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. See, here's what I do, here's what I do, here's what I do. Do, 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 do. Do, do. That's what the Lord thinks of that. <laughs> Can I say that, Sammy? Do we need to edit that out? <laughs> I just realized I got two name tags on here, too. It's called double billing. Uh, thank you. I'm here through Sunday. <laughs> so the tax collector was different than the Pharisee. He stood at a difference. He stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, verse 13, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus says, I'll tell you, this man, referring to the tax collector, rather than the other, went on justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exhausted, exalted. And if you want to sign up for a really rough course from God, believe that some sin that you've caught someone else in that you are not capable of. Because he will either drive you to humility and tears, or he will walk you through the events necessary that you yourself could commit that same sin. Uh, it just We have got to be humble about that. So this is all right here in this verse, this Galatians 6. And as usual, Paul tells it to us right in the first verse. He said, uh, restore him gently. If you come across those who are spiritual, restore him gently. And the word restore was meant to think of bringing someone back to service. Uh, the Greek word that's used for that, they used for mending fishing nets or mending broken bones. Interesting, isn't it? Because the idea there is to bring someone back to useful service. And that's the way we need to think about it. See, once you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God lives inside of your heart, Satan can't touch you. Jesus put it this way in the Gospel of John. He says, you are in my hand, and I'm in the Father's hand, and no one will snatch you out of that. Your eternity is safe. God is not going to leave it up to you. Once you entrust your eternal soul to him, he's not going to let you fail him. He's hanging on. We were at the Grand Canyon this summer, and I was reminded of a story. I wish I could attribute it to the right pastor. Most of what I tell you I've heard before, so I want to make sure you understand I don't have a lot of original material. But uh, I remember hearing this from someone, I think, on the radio one time. He talked, as he was a pastor, he talked about he and his five-year-old son went to the Grand Canyon. He was leaning over the edge. If you've ever been, it really did remind me of this, is that you can actually lean and look down way in, I mean, hundreds of feet down. It's kind of scary, right? He said, you know, what kind of father would I be if I just kind of held a stick out to my son and said, hang on, 
I left it to him to do the hanging on. He said, I'm not doing that with a five-year-old. I got him under here. I got a hold of his belt. I got a hold of his underwear as he's leaning over. I'm not letting him go. No loving father would. Same with you. God loves you. Once you make this deal with him and entrust him, he's not letting you go, regardless of how foolish you might be. Amen? But Satan can do something. He can't have your soul anymore. God's not letting you go. But he can make you ineffective. He can see if he can get you on the sidelines for the game. That's what he wants to do. See, and we're all supposed to be in the game. We're all supposed to be kind of telling other people about it, being winsome to our neighbors, inviting people to coffee and talking with them about their problems. We're supposed to be in the game. Since we have the spirit that lives inside of us, we're supposed to walk by it. And that spirit wants us to tell other people about Jesus. And he wants us to help people. But sometimes we get put on the sidelines. Satan would love to catch you deflating a few footballs so he could suspend you for four games. A topical reference. Right? Or he'd love to see if he could get you to just stay home because you don't feel loved or not be out there. See, he can't have your soul, but if he can make you ineffective, that's that's his second best strategy. Amen? So we want to restore people to get them back into the game once that's happened. We want to set their broken bone. We want to mend their fishing net. We want to get them back to useful service again. That's what Paul means by restore. And sometimes that requires some help. Now, I told you about my friend with the painkiller. Had I come across that and been one of the first people to discover that with him, I don't have the expertise to help him with that kind of a addiction, but I would have. I would have walked with him to a recovery place to some people that could have helped him because sometimes when someone's broken a bone, you've got to get him to a doctor, right? But I would have been glad to have been part of restoring him to useful service. I would have now, right? Much more mature in my walk, I pray, although I'm reminded every week about the fact that I'm not. I hope that makes sense to you. Restoring people to useful service is getting them back in the game. And it might take some time. It might take some expert help, but that's what we want to do. And Paul also says to do that gently. And the the best metaphor I can think of this is if you're at the park and you're watching your grandkids play or your kids and another child comes by, it's not your own, and they trip and fall in the dirt, how would you help them up? Gently. Because that's not your child. But you would help them, right? You'd help them up. And maybe you help them up and you say, hey, listen, there's your mom. Why don't you go see your mom? Right? Maybe you point them to Jesus. Here's what you need to do. But you'd help them up gently. And I got news for you. Even our own children really don't belong to us. God entrusts them to us for a season. But they're really someone else's child. So when we help someone up, let's help them up gently as we would someone else's child. Okay? That's what Paul wants us to do. He goes on in verse 2, and verses 2 through 5 kind of repeat the same things. That's the way Paul writes. He gives us that beautiful first sentence and then kind of draws it out further. Verse 2 says, Carry each other's burdens, and you will fulfill the law of Christ. But then he goes on in verse 5 and says, Each one should carry his own load. And that might seem contradictory. I think that's worth explaining a little bit. In between that, he says, if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Each one should test his own actions, then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to somebody else. That humility that we talk about, often the problem with that is we start comparing ourselves to other people. I've, I've been so guilty of this in the past. I can always find somebody who's less righteous than I. If I look hard enough. And I, my gosh, I don't have to look too hard. And after Monday night's debate, I don't have to look too hard to find uh, people that are less righteous than I. It, but it's, a, it's, just, it's a disaster, though, for human beings to look to other human beings as the gauge of their own righteousness. It's like a contest of who's the tallest midget. <laughs> Is that the wrong word? I, I don't know if I should say that. Little person. I, I'm not trying to be offensive. I... It's just the way I roll. But you get the idea, right? No, we need to be comparing ourselves to God. We need to be walking in step ourselves in that way. Because the minute we start comparing ourselves to each other, that's when we get into trouble. 
And that's what Paul is saying here. Don't do that. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3, uh, 23 says that. So if you start thinking of yourself too highly, of your walk, that's when, you know, the Lord might cause you to stumble just to have that. But he does want us to help each other. Paul's encouraging us to do that. He says, if you help each other, you bury each other's burdens, you fulfill the law of Christ. And what is that beautiful law of Christ? Often that can be condensed to what Jesus said when they asked him, what are the greatest commandments? You remember what he said? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on those two things. That's the law of Christ that you fulfill. But you see, there's two parts of that. There's a part only you can do. I can't love the Lord for you. I can't eat for you. I can't breathe for you. Right? I can't love the Lord for you. But together, we can love our neighbor as ourselves. Does that make sense? And this has been really a mystical part of church history for a long time. There's this idea of the diversity of the individual relationship with God and the unity of Christ's body. And they sought and they studied that for a long time. And the places you would go to study unity and diversity were called universities. Isn't that beautiful? I know that because I'm in education. How's that for a... I didn't, I didn't discover it myself. Someone else told me. So this is part of this. There's a part of this that you have to do for yourself. And then after you're walking with the Spirit, you get to help other people. I pulled this off of the Federal Aviation Administration website. <clears throat> I'll try and read this the right way. See if it sounds familiar. In the event of a decompression, an oxygen mask will automatically appear in front of you. To start the flow of oxygen, pull the mask towards you. Place it firmly over your nose and mouth. Secure the elastic band behind your head and breathe normally. Does that sound familiar? Okay. I, if I was really good, I'd do the Spanish version next, right? Who can breathe for you? No one. You have to do that for yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But then they say this. If you're traveling with a child or someone who requires assistance, secure your mask first and then assist the other person. You can't help people when you're dead. And, and, and you know, this is, this is a serious thing. If you, if you understand what happens during decompression, this phenomenon called hypoxia, where you think you're breathing, and you are, you're taking a gas in and out of your lungs, but it doesn't have the right oxygen content, you have no idea, and the next thing you know, you're asleep. Forever. Right? And so that's why they say, you want to get your mask on first, and then you want to help other people. I, that's a beautiful metaphor for this. You want to... Love the Lord your God first. Because you can't love other people unless God has first loved you. And you acknowledge that. Right? You can't export what you don't possess. Right? So we have to be filled with God's love. And then we can share it with other people. Isn't that a beautiful metaphor? Right? I think that's what Paul is saying. When he says you want to bear each, other bur bear each other's burdens but each one must carry his own load. That own load is your own walking in step with the Spirit. Once you're doing that, then you can help bear other people's burdens. I think that makes the most sense of this, and it's a beautiful thing. I, I looked up a few quotes on this. I found a guy named Donald Guthrie. Mr. Guthrie, if you're listening, I, I don't know you. He wrote a commentary on Galatians. He said this, Those are best able to sustain another who have proved their own power to be sustained in the trials of their own life. Does that make sense to you? I guess I have found this in my own life. That sometimes the trials and things I've suffered have actually prepared me to minister to people in a unique way. And God has put me in their path. If you've been walking with the Lord a long time, you'll see that. If not, you'll still see it. It's just in the future. Isn't that wonderful? And sometimes the biggest scars from our past end up being the bonds that allow us to help somebody in the future. To the point where you might even might even give praise for them on Sunday. The most beautiful thing we can do is help each other as Christians. And the most dangerous thing we can do is by doing so, become prideful and let that knock us off our walk with the Holy Spirit. You know, some of these examples we've been giving are so dramatic about coming along with someone who's got an addiction or something like that. You know, this is probably done more in a very subtle way. 
with you and your Christian friends, sitting over once a week or so having coffee. And if you don't have that kind of community, you need to get, get into some. Maybe this is a place for you to decide to do that tonight. You need to interact with some other people because little by little when we share each other's burdens, they don't get so big that they knock us over. And that's what we do when we have real Christian friends. Real because we can share what's going on with them. However sinful that might be. And they might call us on that and say, oh, come on, you're just imagining that. Those people don't think you're fat. <laughs> they know you are. <laughs> you had three helpings of ribs for crying out loud. Right? So this is a direct quote from a previous conversation. <laughs> your Christian friends will help you with your burdens. They also help keep you humble which is part of what Paul wants us to do. And they give you opportunity to help other people, right? And it's usually done not a touchdown run at a time, but three or four yards in a cloud of dust. And you, in fellowship with other believers, if you've denied yourself that for whatever reason, will you consider becoming a part of a small Bible study, getting together with somebody once a week, once a month for a cup of coffee, piece of pie, rack of ribs, <laughs> and share life with them. That's done a little at a time, and then these problems don't get so big. I want to finish with verse 6. It seems out of place to me, I have to tell you. Verse five, 1 through 5 are about helping each other up. I think verse 7 on through the rest of the, 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 the book, Paul's starting to land the plane. He wants to, as he brings this letter to a conclusion, he wants to review what he's already taught. And I see that happening in verse 7. Verse 6 kind of seems out of place to me. It says, anyone who receives instruction of the word must share all good things with his instructor. Now, I, I don't want to deny that because of the position I happen to be in right now. Right? I don't want to say that's not true. As a matter of fact, I, I believe that is a true concept that you can find other places in your Bible. But I think it best fits here in the context of helping each other up. Now, when you help someone up, you're blessed in a way that is beyond what you can imagine. They share the good things in their life with you. <laughs> and all good things in their life. And when someone helps you up, share with them the blessings that they've helped bring into your life. I really believe that's the context Paul means this in here. In verse 6. So, when someone helps you up, tell them how much it helped you. Tell them how good it was for you to have someone that could come alongside them at that time. I think that's the, the biggest blessing of all time. Maybe somebody you might want to call today. You know what I'm saying? Maybe the Holy Spirit will put that on your heart. Maybe a friend or someone that helped you up and you want to call them and say, you know what? Yeah, I know it was 115 years ago when we were 12, but you helped me in a rough time and I've never told you thank you for that. And tell them, you know, it's meant a lot to me over my years. You're now sharing all good things with those who helped you with that. And I think that's a, a better interpretation of this verse. As we leave now, we're, we're going to ask the Holy Smokes Worship Chorus to come back up here, and they're going to play a song that I really love. I don't know that I requested it, but I like it. When we talk about that image of God holding on to us and not letting go, because He wants to be in charge of your eternity, and He wants you to trust it with Him, and He is trustworthy. You know, we all need a few friends like that. We all need a few people as we walk through this life together that won't let go of us, right? And we need to let some of our friends know that we won't let go of them either. And that's one of the best ways we can walk through life together. Father, we're so thankful that you give us this mystery of going through life together. And it's sometimes wacky and wonderful, and, uh, but, but it's necessary. We need each other somehow. And it, it builds our strength and our love for you as we get to reflect your glory and your forgiveness and your power to others. And we accept that in our own life. We are thankful, Father, that we get to go through life together as Christians and that you will walk with us and hang on to us and that you and our good friends won't let go. Amen.